we gonna so just what are we go? looking at here? So this is a this is a far, uh, Flexo QD uh, proofing press, and so it's actually a flexograph press. And here you have uh, a rubber stamping plate. It's actually a photopolymer uh, rubber, and what happens is it gets inked by this analox with uh, silver ink and it transfers onto the high parts of, of the stamp there and then from there it transfers back onto the film and so using the analogs we can determine how much ink can be applied to the film and of course the doctor blade is there to make sure the analogs is metered properly so, you, so you're putting exactly the right amount of ink exactly the, yeah how does that work and if we want well so the analog has little cones cut into it and if the cones are deeper then you put more ink and so this one has uh, a very small very small cones and so it only puts just a little bit of ink down and it makes a very thin film right and that thin film means that we're very efficient with the ink we don't use very much all right, so you work with partners to make some of these? Yeah, right. So actually you can see their logos here and then of course DuPont provided for us a, a plate for this, uh, this particular film. Uh, and then actually called Poly is, is a company that was actually a university and they're doing some image processing and, and Harper is a guy of course from earlier. They're making the uh, uh, pr proofing press I have right here. What's the image processing that they're doing? So they have to convert it from like a digital file into a an actual piece of plastic, right, or a piece of, of rubber. And the way they do that is by making a file and then making a, a very high pixel count bitmap, right? So they have to make like a 4,000 DPI image, and that's what, uh, what Cal Poly was doing there. Nice, and where does this fit? Okay, so in this machine, you just snap it in right here, you have these little clamps. And then, so now we're turning a proofing press into a production press. And so from here we'll go after the printing, we'll go straight to some drying, and then we'll go to final curing. And what you have here is is uh, the Adfos, which is a near IR dryer. You have uh, uh, some intense uh, infrared light, and so that actually removes the water vapor from the ink. And then here we have the Pulse Forge, which is a photonic curing system, the Pulse Forge 3200. And so you have a pulse of light, which centers the metal particles together. So I think we'll go ahead and, and start it up. Ready? So where would you put the ink? The ink goes right here, and actually you can watch him do it. So he'll he'll lay the ink just between the analogs and the doctor blade. And this is your ink technology. This, that's right. That's the PKM brand. A PFI 500 is the name of the ink. It's not just like a normal ink no, from not a at printer. All. It's What's a going on here? Nanoparticle, and it's dispersed into a liquid. And the solvents are, are primarily water based and, and uh, very safe to use. And so you can see he loads it into the pipette, and here he'll load it right to the doctor blade. So you would have to do this for every how many sheets or you have to do this You'll once see in a while? It, it, yeah, it would, in a system in production you would have a feeding chamber. But Automatically. Just, yeah, exactly. Here we're just kind of giving a little bit, uh, just so we just use just a little bit. We can run the demo many, many, many times. Okay. So we start it up. So here's the print coming out. You know, you need to make some adjustments to make sure the print is right. And then, okay. Five a second or something like that. Every five every second. Five parts every second, something like that. So it goes through here, mm -hmm. it flashes, it comes out. Yep, and then we roll it up. So is this a very precise technology? Uh, how how yeah, can you get actually, it? To you can make a, a very precise print with Flexo. Uh, depending on the plate that you use. You can actually make, uh, in this case, we're actually making about 20 micron lines, very fine little lines. But uh, depending on the plate that you use, you can actually make uh, even less than that. And so that's actually where some areas of development are going on right now. So let's see very an fine example what, what's coming out. Yeah, okay. So. Here's what we were making in this case. And so this is a, 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 just a piano, right? And so here you have, each one is a little, is a little wire. Yeah. And when I touch it, it, it changes the capacitance of that wire, and then I turn that signal into music. And so, in the case of this, you have, of course, uh, 12 channels, right? One for, for C, A, B, so on. And of course, I can, I can play it when I connect it to a device. So, um, can you hold this for a second? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, there, there is uh, some silver, uh, silver powdered particles as an ink. Uh-huh. And it's on some kind of plastic? Yeah, what right. The, what is the structure down there? Yeah, this, so this is plastic, it's polyester, right? And we have like a light uh, pretreatment, and that's for good adhesion. And then, uh, so it's a material that we buy just from the manufacturer. 
and so you can print five of these per second and just, at the speed that you are demonstrating yeah right here, and you actually can do even faster we can do much faster right because we we, we uh, are just set up here at the trade show so you know we don't want to make too much noise or too much mess but this kind of setup they're running usually at about 600 feet per minute so making these parts you're making what 20 or 30 per second and so uh, this one would be connected to some kind of a, a electronic e exactly there. right so and you have a, a connector here where it's called a zip right it's a very small connector you, you grab it there and you have a, a small device which interprets the signals so you you need a little microcontroller but it's a very cheap very common device and uh, so the application for this kind of device would be to, to do a switch, right? On the, on the TVs or on uh, your lamps or anything at home, you have these little buttons, and each one of them is a little contact switch. Well, instead of making a movement to make a contact to a circuit, how about instead we make just a little change of capacitance, and it makes for a much cheaper switch, which has absolutely no wear and tear. Because when I touch it, there's no moving parts for the switch. And so it's cheap? It's cheap, yeah. This part is, is less than a fraction of a penny. And so in this case, I get 12 very large electrodes. A penny is, is one cent? Yeah, one, one US cent. And this is, I don't even know how much less than that, right? Because it's just a little piece of plastic and a couple hundred nanometers of silver ink placed on top of it. So this is, uh, this is printed electronics. This is the best of the printer electronics world right now. We're well, like a famous company doing printer electronics, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we think so, yeah. I mean, especially for Flexo, you know, you have a very efficient system to make a uh, basically to use the silver as efficiently as you possibly can. That's key, right? The silver is expensive, everyone knows that, but the point is if you use only a little bit of it and use it very efficiently, it can actually be really cheap. And one of the ways that we get efficiency is with the pulse forge, right? So we give that flash really high intensity pulse of light and it actually centers the metal together, right? And so now you get a nice conductive, tough conductive track leading from here to there with good properties. So how, uh, how many designs are there coming out of this machine? Like all your customers are doing different things? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Flexo is just one application. You know, there's also inkjet and there's screen. And we actually have, you know, samples of each. Uh, here's one that we actually did some time ago with, with a group that's here called PST. And uh, this is a little tiger. And then the orange is our copper ink. So it's a copper screen print ink. And that's been put actually with PST's uh, silicon ink. And what happens is, uh, as a function of temperature, that you have a difference in the resistance, and you can turn that into a temperature signal. So, uh, PST uh, is using your machine so to print uh, like five a second or more? No, no. In, in this case, it's screen printing. It's a little slower. And so, we're, we're making the metal, and so we're providing to them the metal, and then they provide the silicon print, right? So, that's just one application. This machine. The, the copper does, yes. The copper. Yeah. So, um, how many designs are possible with printer electronics? Well, a lot of different designs, right? So you, one, of, one of the big, really interesting scenes is inkjet, right? And inkjet is digital, right? I can put different images in every type. And in this case, you have, again, a fairly thin layer of ink, maybe one yeah. micron, you maybe two microns. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so with this, you can make, you know, things like RFID tags and switches. RFID tags? Yeah, so that's switches. radio fre frequency identification, right? And so in this way, you have, like, current moving through there, right? And for RFID, that, that current becomes like an electromagnetic wave. It becomes a radio wave, right? And you can communicate between a chip that would be placed onto this tag and a base station somewhere else. So how are printed the uh, RFID chips? Is that, like, is that how most of the RFID chips are made right now? Currently, most RFID chips are still from semiconductor, big wafers, right? And so they take that little chip out and then they place it onto a print. So with a, with a high-speed pick-and-place machine. And actually, an ink like this would be, would be used for, for RFID. So this is a screen print. It's a thicker film of silver. And what you have here is, is some lines, of course, to test the resistance. But these kinds of applications would be used for RFID. It could be used even for lighting, even to carry a, a small amount of power, right? To make some LEDs blink or some, even some lights go. But you're able to do that with your machine? You can, can right. you do every kind, every type of printer electronics or is this a specific For conductors, yeah, types? usually the, the Pulse Forge has applications to each. And the reason is for that we have a lot of control, right? We have a very intense pulse of light. It's short, but that the, the, the height and the width of that pulse we can control very precisely. We can change it only by one microsecond if we want. It usually ranges something from 50 microseconds to 10 milliseconds, right? And if we wanted to be... 521 microseconds we can do that so in this case the other key feature is to keep the bulbs cool right there's a lot of heat inside of this system right and in order to keep it cool we have a system that's over here which is a water cooler 
and the water cooler is flowing over the bulbs. This is a water keeping... cooler. Exactly. Yeah. It's not a server farm or something. This one is the power, right? This is the power supplies. Each one of these is a capacitor bank to send a pulse of energy into the bulbs, right? You have the charging power supplies that fill up the capacitor banks. And here you have the water cooler, right? And the water cooler is keeping the bulbs cool. You keep them at room temperature, then they last a lot longer, right? And I can predict when they'll fail so I can have a common maintenance cycle so everybody can shut down at the same time and make sure that we don't suddenly break and, and lose some money, right? How much are the bulbs? So a bulb is maybe costing, I don't know, $500 or something like that. And so, you know, this It should last have, for a long time? In this application, the one that we're running right here, I, it's infinite life. I don't even know. Infinite, right? maybe. Yeah, it could be. It's a very long time because it's only using about 2% of the bulb's capacity, right? So we actually haven't had an application where we've had to change the bulbs with that. For screen printing, it takes more energy. I have to make a longer pulse, more intense. And so I have to change the bulbs more often. Maybe how, 10 million cycles. How can your company uh, figure out how to make so precise and powerful lamps? How does that work? Well, there's a lot of Is there's a lot of existing technology in lamp design, right? So this we're benefiting from from years and years of research of uh, in in designs of lamps. So we're we're basically just making improvements on on those little lamp designs, little tweaks here and there. But then we're also doing something really unique, which is in the water cooling, right? So water cooling, but also particular types of switches. You have semiconductor switches that can be very efficient and very uh, precisely tuned. Is this an example of what people do with your yeah, machine? Yeah. So this is, uh, How, where is, which part of this is printed? In this case, you have these lines here. And this is actually silver ink, same as what you have right here. So this ink is going in there and they're making... In a t-shirt. Yeah, in a t-shirt. So I was telling you earlier, making lights blink. So here you go. This is done by Satemsa, which is a, um, a research group over in Spain. And they're researching how to do uh, um, wearable technologies, right? We wearable printed electronics. But your machine over there, it, it mostly it's printing on plastic, right? On the often, but in the case of, of something like this, we may also use paper, right? This is so just can, a piece paper of paper. Roll can go through. Yeah, right. Of course, we can use paper, we can use plastic, and uh, even sometimes we use glass, especially for for screen printing. And uh, all right, so so this is uh, which generation is this? So this one is the is the 3200 X2. X2 is meaning that the bulbs are six inches long. Uh, so that's the length of the bulb, and then you stack them side by side to make the width. And in this case, it has a nine inch wide width. And so every time you pulse, we're pulsing six by nine inches, right? The next pulse, six by nine inches. Is this, uh, you've done several generations before, or? Yeah, well, and so the way it kind of turns out is if you want to get started in this kind of uh, processing, you start with the 1000 series machines, right? We have two levels of this machine, which yeah. is the 1200 and the 1300. And, and so the, the the, but this this is a different machine, but so so what, what's it called? Uh, uh, this is just smaller prototyping, bigger prototyping. Right, right. So for batch processing, right? So you he's drawn out the table here. You put your sample onto the table, and then it moves in, flashes, and moves back out. Right. So you you're only processing a single print, one or two prints uh, every minute or something like that. So it's a much slower process. But what that means is that you get to see, okay, is this process right for me? because I get to test just one or two pieces or even 10 pieces. If I want to make 10,000 pieces, I need to move to the web. And so your customers mostly have both? Many customers start with this machine and then they move to that machine. So you start with the research and then you move to the production. This is mass production, no? This is a mass production machine, yeah. Because you're making series, yeah. enough for uh, the demand for a whole planet. That's, that's the idea, yes, absolutely. You get a lot of density of manufacturing power, right? And that's the idea. When you want to buy a machine, you can make a lot of parts with. And that's exactly the intention of building a machine like this over a web. So your customers need to have very uh, uh, attentive engineers, uh, also measuring how much light intensity for how long you need. Mm -hmm. All that kind of calculation is, so all that's is something done that they on have the to... on the 1,000 level, right? They figure out there exactly. what they need. Figure out everything you need to do, define your process at the 1,000 level. And of course, the machine is also watching how are the bulbs doing, is, is the process correct? Are the bulbs doing what I think they should be doing? So we have this QC using photobolometry, right? We look at the actual output coming from the bulb and we display it under the screen. We say, okay, that looks good, right? And then once you have the process defined, then you move over to production, and in production we have many of the same QC factors going on all the time, right? Every time the pulses fire, we look at them and make sure, are they okay? Yeah, okay, so we move on. And the settings from there are exactly compatible over there? Exactly, in fact, the same calibration, many all that customers stuff? are doing their, their research and development on one side of the planet, they find a series of conditions, they send them over to the other side of the planet for production. Uh, we can send conditions back and forth.
And how long time does it take to put another uh, design in there and start making it something different? It just depends. So you're already doing some research based off of the 1000 series and maybe it takes you a week or something like that to and define you your process. This one. And then you send it over here. And you get the, the, the mold done right for the, 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 the head and stuff. Exactly, right, right. Well, so we're not changing anything about the design of the machine, only little digital conditions that the machine uses to create the pulse of light. Right, so for every process, if it's screen printing or if it's inkjet, they're using the same machine. They're just putting in different conditions. Are you also training the engineers that, that, that use this machine? Absolutely. So this is the basis of my job. One is to define applications for the processes, and the next one is to move and install the machine and actually train the engineers how to operate it. Around the world? Yeah, absolutely. So this, is, uh, this has been uh, quite popular. Absolutely. It's quite uh, yeah, we are I mean, installing... it's a special machine, but I'm guessing yeah. you're, you're making a bunch? Yeah, well, we're based in the United States, and we're installing machines in Germany, in uh, Japan, and just recently even in China, and other places like that as well. So it, it just depends on where the manufacturing is happening. Cool.